Hi there. Welcome, welcome to this marvelous occasion that we have presented for ourselves, an articulation uh, between artist and rabbi conversing about a central topic in the Torah. And this week we speak about the sin of the golden calf. We have present um, Rabbi Ben Greenfield who is, leads the Waterfront Brooklyn Jewish community as the rabbi of the Greenpoint Shul. Originally from Los Angeles, Ben was trained at Yeshivat Haaretz Sion, Yeshivat Un Yeshiva University, Oxford and John Hopkins, and was awarded the Tikva Fund and Wexner Graduate Fellowship. Ben is the founder of the Upper West Side Moisha House and served at Rikers Island Correctional Facility as the High Holidays and Passover Rabbi. We also have present uh, Rob, Professor Robert Katz, uh, sculpt, who uh, is, has sculptural installations, often utilize a rich visual language to explore issues about person, personal Jewish identity and remembrance. His art reflects themes of exile, redemption, and moral imperative. Um, I don't want to take any more time away from the presentation because we have a really delightful presentation here today. Without further ado, um, Rabbi uh, Ben, would you please uh, frame the Parsha for us? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to frame the Parsha, but like the art you're about to see, I'm really going to go beyond it as well and invite you into going beyond the Parsha as well. So just a word about the Parsha. Here we are in Parsha Kitisa. Um, the first aliyah of this, of this Parsha is unique in that it's all law. It's all code, the first aliyah. Um, we open up with a mitzvah to take a census of the Jewish people. The way we take that census is everybody is commanded to give half a shekel. You count up the half shekels, you know how many people there are. Uh, then there's the command to create the key or the wash basin, which was part of the Mishkan, part of the tabernacle. And then we get a few more sort of final details about how to build the Mishkan and the ingredients for the Mishkan. So there's a special anointing oil. If you're going to anoint the Kohen Gadol later, if you're going to anoint a king, there's a special oil that has to be created uh, for that purpose. Likewise, there's a special spice mix, uh, the katoret, the incense mix. It has to be made a very particular way, and that is offered um, every day uh, in the Beit HaMikdash. It's also offered specifically on Yom Kippur, and it's a very specific katoret mix. Uh, we find out sort of after all the instructions the Mishkan are, are given, who's going to actually build a Mishkan? Bitzalel is going to build it. And finally, one last rule about everybody's like, Moshe is hearing all the rules of Mishkan. He's ready to tell the people one last rule before you start building the Mishkan, the rules of Shabbat, which is no matter how important this construction process is, uh, you can't build it on Shabbat. You got to keep that pause, keep that, that break. Um, so what's interesting is at the end of that first Aliyah, like we have completed the full instruction of how to build the Mishkan. This started two parts ago in Truma and then Tetzave and now the beginning of Kitisa. It's like, what could go wrong? Everything's great. Uh, Moshe is currently up on Har Sinai receiving the directions of the Mishkan, and he's completed the task. He's received all those directions. Um, and then, and then it all changes. The, the camera, if you will, which has been on Sinai for the last two plus Parshas, we watched uh, Moshe walk up Sinai after the Ten Commandments. We watched him um, go up to receive all the rules of the Mishkan. The camera has been focused on him receiving all these rules, receiving the textbook, the, the, the blueprints, if you will, for the Mishkan. Well, the camera moves. It pans downhill, down mountain, and a lot is going on down there. And the rest of the Parsha is about that, what's going on down there. Namely, the people are getting antsy. The people are worried about Moshe. And ultimately, the people want to build a golden calf. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail about that golden calf uh, and that narrative. Um, but it occupies much of the Torah, uh, much of this Parsha, excuse me. Um, the people come to Aaron, they want a God, they want a God, and they create it. Aaron, Aaron uh, gathers the gold and creates it, and the people declare it, the God who took them out of Egypt. Uh, the actual God is deeply incensed about this, tells Moshe what's going on. Moshe is deeply incensed. Moshe comes down, breaks the tablets, and then there's a whole aftermath of really punishing very severely um, the idolaters, those who created the, the calf. Um, I think 
you know, there's this funny thing in Parshas. If something's at the end of Parsha, we often kind of tend to forget about it. And I wonder if some of the, when our sages cut up the Torah, if there was something a little intentional there. So the end of the Parsha is really a lot of the punishment. Um, a lot of people are killed by God, by Moshe. Moshe asked the Levites to, to lead in that, in that uh, process of execution. Um, and also even survivors, Moshe goes around, he takes the, the calf, grinds it up, grind, this is so, we, we forget this image. He grinds up the calf, takes the gold, mixes it with water. So we have, we have calf water, golden calf water, and he makes everyone drink it. So like to the survivors, like it's really intense, really intense. Now, um, the, the Parsha also has really beautiful scenes of Moshe defending the people. As much as Moshe is incensed about this, it is Moshe who comes to God and says, you're gonna have to find a way to forgive them. Um, and you know, God, God's initial plan is I wanna destroy this whole people and start again with you, Moshe. And Moshe refuses to hear that. No way, you're, you're gonna find a way to forgive them. And you're gonna find a way to take us up to the land of Israel. You can't abandon us now. So Moshe is really in both roles. He is almost just as incensed as God is uh, about this great sin, but he's also the great advocate of the Jewish people. And uh, the climax for me, theologically, of this parsha is is God offering that forgiveness and, and announcing the Yirgimu Midot Rachmim, the thirteen uh, attributes of compassion, uh, which we sing over and over and over again on Yom Kippur, because this is the model in this parsha. There, in the middle of the parsha, is the model of God actually taking a step back and finding out how to forgive the people. Now, that's a little note about this parsha. Wonderful, beautiful parsha, um, and we will see in a moment uh, a artistic depiction of it. But um, as you're going to see in a moment. Um, the piece of art we're about to witness is much is about much more than Kitisa. It's about many scenes in the Torah, and it will reference and speak to many scenes in the Torah. So uh, I'm not the artist, so I won't tell you more, but I will, in, in for my rabbi hat, if you will, ask that um, as we're about to experience the art, uh, because there's so many scenes and so many parshas referenced in it, I ask you to think not just uh, about the specific content of the art we're going to see in the different scenes, be it in Genesis, be it at the end of the Torah, um, but I ask you to think about the experience of being a person who holds on to Torah stories. The sense of what do Torah stories feel like to you? What is their texture? Um, yeah, what's their what's their texture? And how do they live in your brain? Um, do they live brightly, heavily? Um, are they dirty? Are they clean? Um, that that when I saw this art, those were some of the questions that that were running through my mind. So there will be so many things to focus on and notice. But my ask is is to to also think, um, how do stories in the Torah sit with me, and to use that also as a frame for looking at the art that we're about to see. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand things off to Robert. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I'm uh, coming to you from my studio in Maine. And uh, we have tons of snow outside, and it's been freezing the past month. And today it's 60 degrees, it's rainy and windy, and God willing, we're not going to lose power. <laughs> and so uh, if I disappear, that's the reason why. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, talk a little about what brought me to this project and, um, and then walk us through the uh, artwork, because there are a lot of sort of different components to it. Um, I, I'm a sculptor and an installation artist. Uh, mostly I work in welded steel and mixed media. So when the opportunity came to uh, work on this project, there wasn't an obvious direction for me. Um, and for a while I was sort of uh, uh, lost because I just didn't know uh, where my, what I should put on my palette and how I should uh, create the work of art. Uh, and then I uh, just so happened, went to the movies and I saw Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. And uh, it made me remember back, I think in 1957 when uh, Jerome Robbins and, and um, Glenn Bernstein came up with this brilliant idea of bringing forth a, a story that was written, I believe in the late 16th century by Shakespeare um, and, and place it in a contemporary context. And for me, that uh, all of a sudden began to make sense. In other words, um, you know, when we take these old ancient stories and we embed them with elements of our contemporary life, I think it, it creates a connection with, with the story to us and, um, 
and helps us to understand the narrative and um, and, 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 and really it makes it more relevant today um, when, when we do that. So, so that was the approach that I was uh, uh, going to take uh, in this project. Um, and so uh, the first part of my process was um, uh, to go around and fortunately in Maine, we have lots of old barns and to collect materials. And um, I was bringing to my studio um, all of the sort of residue of the 20th century artifacts that I was finding in Maine barns that were being thrown away. And when people saw my studio, they were wondering why I was gathering all this junk, but I didn't see it that way. Um, every piece of steel and um, item that I was bringing back, I saw that it had some sort of biblical, biblical uh, connection. Uh, the other thing that I began to do uh, for myself was that when I when I read the Parsha that I was assigned, I really, I needed to go back to the beginning. I needed to put it into context uh, because focusing on, in the, on the Bible was not sort of uh, prevalent in, in my process. So the discussions that I was having with, uh, with the rabbi was extremely helpful. I also happened to meet a, uh, a retired reverend from Princeton's a theological seminary who agreed to chat with me about his perception of these biblical stories. And then I was also listening to all of the lectures by the biblical scholar, Ayir Sakovich from Hebrew University. So um, all of these discussions that I was participating in really helped me focus in on um, where I wanted to sort of go uh, with this project. Uh, so I'm, go I'm going to begin to, let me just, Find it here. Okay, just wait one second. I sort of lost the. Uh, I, I hold it. I'm getting some technical help here to. Your slides. Yeah. I'm trying to find my my slides. They would be back up here. Thank you for your patience. Yes, thank you for your patience. It's right up here. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so um, if, if everybody can see the images, yep. Okay, so we're just putting this on a, on a slideshow. Okay, I think we're all set now, right? Can everybody see that? Okay, good. Okay, so these were the uh, artifacts that all of a sudden began to take over my studio. And uh, every element here I saw was part of the puzzle um, that I was going to begin to put together. So um, these are, I have gotten through 10 stories um, and I plan to continue on sort of maneuvering through, um, through the Torah. Um, and here we see an image of the piece all put together. So there are, I think, different ways of looking at my project. Um, when we study the Parsha, we sort of, it seems we separate them and we focus in on one story a week. Um, and then when we put all the Parshas together, we have the totality of the Torah. And so in, in, in this image, you really don't see the distinction between the stories. Um, there's an integration because of the use of color and texture and materials and text. And so uh, the final piece as, as it appears here is about uh, 12 feet long and about four or five feet high. And then what I would just like to do is just sort of walk us through the different, uh, the different narratives. And uh, as I said, what I needed to do um, to create this artwork was to 
go back to uh, the beginning. And, and so the first uh, assemblage that I created, here you see the, uh, the indication of the sort of the molten metal and the formation of the earth, the gradation from dark to light and the, the Garden of Eden and the infamous uh, fruit. And on the right, we see the, uh, we, we see an image of, of Eve cast off and, and in this sort of uh, glass vial is the uh, skin of a snake. Uh, in in the, the second Parsha of the story of Cain and Abel, I represent uh, Cain's uh, avocation uh, as, as a farmer in terms of using a, an old tractor. And on the right, we see a young boy uh, in a woodcut tending his flock. And then in the middle of the piece, we see the conflict uh, of, the, of the brothers and perhaps the bloodied sickle that was used uh, to murder him. And then on the right is the, uh, is the uh, ram's uh, skull. I would also like to say that um, at, also at the same time that I was creating this, I was reading about the uh, German artist uh, whose name is Joseph Beuys. And uh, Beuys was an artist that worked in the uh, 60s and 70s. And um, what, he was a theorist. And in his writings, he talked about how art needs to be embedded in the spiritual world, that it needs to embrace politics and environment, um, as well as humanism. And so um, there was a connection that I was beginning to formulate in terms of how he was sort of uh, presenting works of art. So what I chose to do, rather than taking um, quotes from the biblical text to title these pieces, I began to take some of the concepts that uh, Boyce was presenting. For example, like on this one, all art must carry with it the first days of creation. Okay, um, so we have worked our way through the story of Cain and Abel. And then uh, here we have the flood. Uh, and here's a good example of, of using contemporary objects as sort of a biblical metaphor. Uh, back in 1987, we had some pretty catastrophic floods up here in Maine and we had to evacuate. And it never dawned upon me to build an ark. But what I did do is I, I, I loaded the dog and the cat and the gerbils and the kids in the back of the pickup truck. So the pickup truck becomes the uh, symbol of the ark. And, um, and as again, we sort of work our way sort of through this uh, assemblage, we have the faces, which includes the images of Noah and his sons. And then we have the bird that was sent out from, from the ark to collect the, uh, the olive leaves. And then the color palette symbolizes the rainbow that, um, that uh, I believe ended the story. Uh, in, in this piece today, the edifice lies in ruins, the story of the Tower of Babel. This had particularly significance to me because I teach in a program where I have lots of architecture students. And when I was uh, reading this and working my way through this Parsha, you know, it dawned to me, what if it was written a bit differently? Because it was really an extraordinary moment in human history to think that in antiquity, uh, man was able to come together and build this extraordinary architectural structure. It required architects, it required engineers, it required a skilled labor force, but most important, it, it required uh, collaboration and cooperation amongst people. And of course, we know what happened to the tower, that it was burnt and destroyed and people were dispersed. And so in this assemblage, the violin um, becomes the metaphor for the tower. The violin is, violin is also an instrument that's mostly played in the context of an orchestra. And so uh, it is a good uh, example of um, the power of collaboration. And then I also wondered if instead of the Tower of Babel, if the people would have built the Parthenon or the skyline of New York or the Guggenheim Museum, if it would have sort of come to the same uh, end. Uh, truth is often stranger than fiction, Lot and the angels and the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, it begins up on top. Uh, to me, this symbolizes the voice of God. And then you see the uh, molten lava and the destruction of the city. 
Uh, Lot and the angels are depicted by, by images of contemporary men in suits, and maybe they're having a gin and tonic. And uh, on the left, you see a vial that is filled with um, salt, Lot's wife. Um, and it was interesting because when I was working on this project, I, I noticed amongst the pile of broken record and the title uh, uh, on the record uh, of the song on the record was Kissed by an Angel. And here we have elements of myth and ritual, the binding of Isaac at the altar. Um, up on top, again, uh, this symbolizes the voice of God and perhaps the instrument that would have been used to sacrifice Isaac and uh, the binding. And then um, it was going to be a burnt offering. And so inside the tableau is the construction of, uh, of a burning altar. Protect the flame, the burning bush. Um, I, had, I, had, I, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to depict the burning bush. And then I noticed a root system that I had dug out of the wood pile about 25 years ago. And I, I kept looking at it for 25 years, trying to figure out what it meant. And then all of a sudden I understood and I took a saw and I cut it in half and I polished it. And to me, it begins to represent uh, the burning flame and the other elements in this assemblage or other sort of contemporary um, devices that uh, illuminate. Uh, set the social healing process in motion. Living conditions must change. Uh, exodus, bondage, place, liberation. Um, so the other thing about my work is that um, every, every, every item, every color, every texture is intentional. It's deliberate. Um, Although I, I don't find it necessary to explain the symbolism of each object, because really what I want people to do is to look at these objects and perhaps come to their own conclusions or interpretations. So on top of this piece, we have these um, elements that um, signify, that signify uh, the plagues. And, um, and then on, on the bottom, on the right, you see the chains that symbolize bondage. And uh, one really interesting uh, artifact that I found was this old photograph on the bottom of a group of Jews on horseback who were escaping the Nazis during World War II as they were sort of marching through the desert of Egypt. So you see the Sphinx and the pyramids in the background. So in a way, it's an actual photograph of, uh, of the Exodus. In, in the contemporary, in a contemporary sense, of course. Retribution and redemption. And so here we are in uh, the Parsha that, that, that the rabbi was talking about. Um, on the top, you see um, these different objects that to me connected to uh, the 10 commandments uh, in, symbolically. Uh, then you have the golden calf and you have other calves. You have an image of the calf that is in one of Picasso's paintings. And what you really can't see in the photograph are other sort of famous golden calves that have been created uh, by artists. And below that is the, is the calf was burnt and you see sort of the burnt uh, residue of the calf. And below that is the, the vial filled with that liquid that I think the rabbi referenced uh, that people were made to drink. Um, on the right is the, uh, is the uh, ark carrying the broken tablets and the, the cast hands symbolize that covenant between uh, man and God. And in the, in, in below that in the cigar case are the uh, fragments uh, of the tablet, tablets. And uh, the, the last partial that uh, is part of this uh, collage is the Poetics of Death, um, which sort of um, looks at the life of, of Moses and his death at 120 years. And, um, and so that's where I, I'm at right now uh, with this piece. So again, um, I, I think we could separate the pieces like we have just done to look at each individual story and then we can go back and we could sort of put them together to create this overall collage in which all the stories are um, related and integrated. So um, 
if any, Rabbi, do you have any other uh, thoughts that you would like to share? Questions which I've never replied in the negative. Um, sure, so I, I wanna, uh, there's so much here. This is such a rich work and uh, it's important to me to leave really extra time for questions because I know when I, you first showed me this work, I just have so many, so many questions. And I'm glad folks uh, on the chat have already begun uh, pointing some of those out. So I'll, I'll, I wanna share what this does for me and the kind of questions that it, it opens for me and a little bit the kind of answers it gives as well. So um, beyond each scene being a really striking and interesting representation, depiction, uh, evocation of that particular biblical narrative, I think that this piece um, expresses and communicates maybe three parts of, of, of the nature of Torah narrative, the nature of Torah, study, uh, Torah stories that, that I am captivated by. Three parts of the experience of what it's like for me to like read a story in the Torah. And I've never, while I've seen many stories depicted, I've never seen the feeling of reading and experiencing biblical stories depicted. And for me, that, that's what came up. So I wanna share with you all um, three elements of reading the text of Torah sto stories that are recreated for me in the experience of visually seeing this piece of art. So one thing comes up is whenever I read it, what I love about reading Torah stories is the ability to almost infinitely zoom in to details and find meaning there, and also to zoom out from the story and look at the context of the story and look at the Torah as a whole and find a new layer of, of meaning and insight there. Uh, I think there was that classic film uh, in the 70s, The Power of Ten, you know, where you can zoom out of, the, of our planet 10, mm. step, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, and then you can zoom in as, you know, all the way out to the galaxy, and then you can zoom in all the way down to quarks and atoms. Um, and I, I have that with Torah. So you know, maybe the standard level, our regular earth level or earthling level is each, each story, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden with the snake, uh, the story of the golden calf. That narrative is our, is our base level. But um, you know, there's such so much joy and potential to zoom in. Uh, so you know, in the golden calf story, Moshe smashes the tablets, sh shatters them. Why? And what's the, what's the symbol? What's the meaning and the symbol of that, that image of the shattered tablets? Um, why a gold calf? Why gold? Why a calf? Um, and why do they go to Aaron? Why do they ask Aaron for his involvement? So beyond the story as a whole, you can sort of zoom into specifics. And it's certainly a big part of rabbinic discourse in the classical sense, the capital R sense, to really zoom into like specific words and details. Why is it Vaida Bear he spoke instead of Ayomer he said? Uh, why is there that extra letter over there? There doesn't need to be a hey there, doesn't need to be above there. And classically, Chazal, the sages of the Talmud, loved to find uh, deep meaning in each individual level, uh, letter, excuse me, even the, the crowns on the letter. So there's this capacity when, it, when reading, this urge when reading to really zoom in, not just the story as a whole, but the individual components, individual symbols, down to the individual word. That's just part of the experience. And likewise, you couldn't, if, the reason we bought our own tickets when we were there in Disney was that oh. we didn't have. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate that the tone in that really was like the tone of Torah study. Though I know it was about tickets, but I thought that was very cool. Um, and then uh, there is, pardon me, I'm just popping back in. Um, but then there's just as much wisdom to be gained from zooming out uh, in, in Torah study. Uh, how does this, what's immediately precedes the golden calf narrative? What immediately follows it? I mentioned before that it's, pre it's preceded by relatively wrote laws. It's also preceded immediately by Shabbat. Is there some connection between Shabbat and the golden calf story? The golden calf story does begin with malacha, with labor. They are sculpting, they are creating. Um, so you could also, you know, zoom back just what are the narratives right before and after. And then also, you know, does gold come up in other stories? Do calves come up in other stories? I mean, it evokes for me the image of the, uh, the ram that's caught in the brush during a Kedat Yitzchak and that is sacrificed instead of Isaac. Now we have another domestic animal, not a ram, but a calf that is also here gonna be sacrificed. It's gonna, it's gonna be melted down. Is that intentional, the use of borrowing that icon? Um, you know, Moshe is gonna give the people this water to drink and it's gonna be scary. Maybe it's even a kind of a uh, trial. Uh, I'm reminded of Avraham offering his guests water. I'm reminded of, um, of scenes at wells where Mo Moshe makes sure that there's enough water for the female shepherdesses. 
Um, so yeah, is that is that intentional? The use of the watering image is that intentional? The, the calf, the gold. You can zoom out and you can begin seeing parallels and borrowings between the stories, and that's a whole other joy. The zooming in is a joy. The zooming out. So turning here, I. I look at this art and that's, my mind is just drawn into those questions. I'm looking, I can, as, uh, as Robert showed us, we were able to zoom in on, on one individual story, uh, but the image up right now is obviously all of them together, begging us to ask, like, is there a comparison between the two? The violin and the record, the musical um, connotation uh, in the bottom left, that face that's turned away from us versus the, the six or so faces uh, from the COVID and choking scene. Um, I'm all, I, I just look at this and I wanna find parallels, connections, just like textually I would. And of course we can zoom in. And earlier Robert uh, was showing with us uh, each individual narrative and my, my mind is just like, I wanted to know, I wanted to know, like, why is there a vial there? Why is there an orange? Why on the top left, you can see up there, the top left, why is that orange and not yellow? What's that about? Um, so the visual experience for me is such a, a deep parallel to the textual experience and, and that's a real gift. So that's one piece of zoom in and zoom out. I'll try to move a little more quickly through the next. Also, my experience looking at this piece is um, I, I look at it and I see a mix of this beautiful mix of disorder and the potential for order. It's this chaos that's like waiting for explanation. And I think that Rashi has this term, Rashi describes how some verses are screaming out for interpretation. And there's this beautiful feeling that I get visually when I look at the art here, the same. It's, it's, it's ordered enough that I know there's meaning there and I wanna know what the meaning is. And it's chaotic enough that I can't figure it out immediately. And so I'm, call, I'm, I'm, I'm called into this almost interpretive game of trying to figure it out. And I open up the, the text of the Chumash and the Hebrew letters call to me that way. And here I get the visual version of that. The objects call to me that way. Um, and finally, um, about that chaos really is, you know, it's so tempting to hope and imagine that there will be a clear message and a clear takeaway. If I just spend an hour parsing through these objects, I'll figure out what Robert Katz was thinking in his head. I'll come up with an answer for all the reasons why that piece is orange and there's glass over here and that and uh, and, and that theme is brokenness, whereas in, in this one, the wood is whole. Um, if I just give myself enough time, I'll figure it out. It's so tempting. But I think, and I, I'm curious what Robert Katz, what, the, what our artist here thinks, that there, there isn't an obvious intention, and there isn't some secret behind the order of these objects. And maybe this sounds a, a little uh, negative or pessimistic, but I actually think it's very beautiful. I, I, I know there are always layers of meaning and takeaways from the Torah, but also I think the Torah was intentionally written in a way that it doesn't always produce an obvious and a clear message. And maybe the Torah, beyond the moments when it does provide a clear message, it actually just provides us a clear set of symbols and tropes. And it becomes our work to juggle those symbols and tropes and reference those symbols and tropes, even if we never really exactly figure out why those are our symbols and why they're in the order they're in. So just to give one example of that, I'll, I'll call up the story of the Akeda, of, of, of the almost sacrifice of Isaac. I'm not sure if personally I'm ever gonna figure it out. What's the precise message there? What's the takeaway? We were not given a Torah that is full of obvious takeaways. This is not second grade story time, for better or worse. It just isn't. It's not. That was not God's choice. That was not the Torah's choice. Um, so I, I don't think I'm going to ever walk with a clear message of what the kid is meant to teach us. But I do know that in my life, whenever there's any conversation about notions of sacrifice, self-sacrifice, giving your all, um, conversations about courage, about parenthood, about fatherhood, any of those conversations, I'm just going to reflect them through and frame them with that story. I feel very lucky that when I, when I think about courage, when I think about fatherhood, when I think about the tension between loyalty to family and loyalty to God, I'm not starting from nothing. It won't be the first. Um, I won't be the. It's. I won't be. It won't be the first time I'm thinking about it, and I won't be. And and I won't be the first one because I'm part of this tradition that bequeathed me certain tools. So I'm going to be able to reflect those questions through the prism of that story of those stories through the the signs and symbols of those stories, and that's what I see in this art. I see a gathering, a beautiful gathering in visual form of sort of all the best hits of those visuals and signs and tropes finally laid out in front of me visually. And I, I will absolutely want to figure out their interpretation and I'm gonna to wanna to zoom in and zoom out. But at the very end, just seeing them in front of me without an obvious clear message, 
but as a set of symbols and tropes, I think really accurately uh, reflects how I personally uh, relate to Torah study and to and specifically to the study of, of Torah stories and narrative. So that's what I get. Um, I will speak. Stop speaking. I'm curious, uh, Robert, do you have any reaction specifically to my words? Uh, what that triggers in your mind? And then maybe from there, we'll uh, begin to move to some questions. Why don't we open it up to questions? Sure. Okay. First, uh, we have a question from Aviva Schaffer. How did you decide which Torah stories you wanted to include? And what was your process week by week? Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the stories that I focused in on initially, the stories in which there were obvious uh, tension and conflict between man and God. And so, um, yeah, so, so I think all of these stories speak to that relationship. And um, I mean, that's what caught my attention initially. And, uh, and, and, and that, was, that was the motivation behind my selection process. Um, as I mentioned, um, I, I intend to keep working on this project and then move on to the other books. And, um, you know, the other narratives. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a vision of how they're all gonna play out, um, but it was, uh, it was good to take a break at this point in the project because it was so intense for me and to sort of step back from it and, um, and just give it, and, and just think about it for a while before I move forward. Rabbi, uh, in your, in your Dvar Torah that you uh, wrote about this, you speak about that week to week, um, the stories embedded in, in the queries that kind of uh, come out of it. And so uh, uh, would you care to kind of expand on that thought? Uh, on which thought? On, on that thought of kind of in the process of, of thinking about which stories uh, were of most intrigue, uh, kind of the parallel with that in your Dvar Torah. Oh, uh, <laughs> I am not sure what you mean. <laughs> so you can try one more time or maybe we should pass another question, your call. <laughs> uh, let's, let's move on to uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Dan Reich uh, kind of asks about um, how, how the golden calf is viewed as bad and yet in another uh, uh, story, the serpent of brass is a, a positive symbol. Um, and how do you resolve that tension? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll add to that. You don't have to go all the way to the serpent brass. Uh, you can go to the Mishkan, right right there. As, as they're building an idol, which is very bad, we are in the midst of building a home full of physical objects. At the center of that home will be an Aron. On top of the Aron are two angels. Those angels have physical form. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot to be said here. Uh, I'm not really going to answer your Serpent of Brass question, although it's very good. But I think the, the, the traditional read is something like the Serpent of Brass was tall. The whole point was that you're looking up. The goal is that you're looking up past the serpent to God in some sense. Uh, you can buy that or not. Uh, I, I think there are similar interpretations of those Kruvim, those angels that are in the Aron. Um, there's a, a claim that's been made that uh, in the ancient Near East, it was very common to depict gods as riding on the shoulders of angels, like sort of on top of the angels. And in our depiction in the, in the Mishkan, there are two angels there, and you're looking for what's riding on top of them, and there's nothing. There's just empty space. That's one way I kind of make sense of it. But to step back, I, I, yeah, in Dan's question, I think, and which a little bit actually relates to the art, there's this very interesting complicated stepping forward and stepping back from materiality and icon iconography uh within the torah don't make an image of god do not make an image of god do not worship that image of god and also the sort of most sacred place is going to be full of physical objects that have a very detailed structure and are made out of material items like gold and silver there's a lot a lot to be said there i'll leave it at that and yeah tying it back to the art i mean i love the materiality of this art i think it it just shows the the earthiness, the materialness of our relationship to God in a biblical sense. Yeah. Uh, another question. 
Yes, yes. I wonder uh, if this great artwork that we just uh, heard about will be in any museum in Vermont or anywhere else that we can go and personally visit and take our own pictures. <laughs> oh, well, well, thank you. Um, you know, I just finished the project, so I haven't really had time to begin to find uh, exhibition locations for the piece. But hopefully that will happen at some point. I hope so. Uh, Judith Sobel says, hello. Um, looking at this remarkable piece, I am reminded of the form of medieval Christian polyptych or altar pieces. Were these in your mind at all? No. <laughs> no, it's an interesting, it's an interesting connection, but no, I, I wasn't thinking about that. <clears throat> Rabbi, uh, oh yeah, Rabbi, please. Sure, I was an artist. Uh, I'm curious for you, which scene for you sort of came most easily? Just it, it flowed, it came out, and which scene for you just presented was was troublesome, was difficult, was hard to, to come out? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the one that came uh, first and the easiest was the one on the death of Moses. Really? Why is that? Yes. Um, you know, I, I, some of these materials that I've integrated into these pieces, I've actually lived with for a long time. And uh, there are elements in, in the death of Moses, particularly with the broken head, that for a long time I made the associate that I thought that I, I was staring at, at Moses. And, and so I, I, just like with the burning bush, I, I knew that root at some point was going to be integrated into uh, a piece that um, similar to what I have uh, used it for. So, so I, I think that the objects were there in front of me and um, it just became really logical to begin with that piece, although I sort of end the story uh, with that piece. Uh, the most difficult one, I think, was the, um, the battle between the battle between uh, Cain and Abel. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I mean, to me, um, the whole story is very troubling, and um, and you know, having these brothers battle each other and uh, kill each other it was such a troubling story. But I, I really struggled with how I was going to depict it. And, and the piece that I most enjoyed working on was, um, was the Tower of Babel. And, and we had talked a little about that in terms of, um, I, I, again, I mean, I, I just view it uh, differently. I, I view that story as one of celebration of, of man's creativity. Um, and, and so it, it, it became a piece that had a, a great deal of meaning to me um, as, as a sculptor. Yes, well, one more parallel there of everybody, seemingly everybody united in the, in the building of a central project, Tower of Babel and Golden Calf, and not very happy about that, it seems like the Tower. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I have uh, another question for you, but I want to, somebody wants to raise their hand or we'll throw something in on the chat. Uh, a, a question uh, thinking about um, uh, this idea of uh, reconstructing a personalized Mishkan and uh, Rabbi Kahana sees uh, um, reconstructing the Mishkan through materials of our own lives as something uh, that likens to a B'Tzalel. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, the personalized uh, version of recreating these stories and what that kind of means from an interpretive perspective? Uh, that for me. <laughs> well, I uh, in my in my piece, um, I, I tried to address I think a question that has uh, haunted and inspired many interpreters of the Torah, which is why is the Torah have stories at all? Like, why do we need stories? And uh, laws are clear. 
Uh, laws give you something to do. Right? We all want something to do. Laws tell you the way you should lead your life, the way you should, uh, yeah, what is clean and not clean, what is forbidden and, and permitted, what is wise, what is not so wise, so clear. Um, but what are the stories, what, what, why have these stories? Um, so in my piece, I address uh, Rashi asks that question and gives maybe most, may, for some, a very deflating answer or disappointing answer, which is Rashi basically uh, agrees with his own assumption. You're right, there shouldn't be stories. And like, okay, we have all these stories. He explains them away why they're there, but we really shouldn't. Um, Ramban asks a similar question, which is, I understand why we have stories, because clear stories teach us clear messages. The story of creation can teach us that God created the earth, that we all come from somewhere, that we all come from the same source. These are important themes. But Ramban uh, kind of dodges all the stories that aren't so clear. Why do we have complicated stories without a clear message? And um, I think it's really later figures who begin developing a sort of theology of complexity, uh, and that the narrative complexity is meant in some way to actually match our own experience of life and of being human. Um, I said later, but really there's a gorgeous uh, midrash in Shema Rabbah that basically claims that the reason why there are contradictory passages in the Torah is because our own experience of human life is full of contradictions. Life turns into death and death turns into life and soil turns into bodies and body turns into soil and ocean turns uh, and, and land erodes and turns into ocean and then the sand washes up and turns back into land. How else could we have a Torah if not a Torah of contradiction? So I, I'm inspired that way also when I see this piece of art. There is no clear message. I feel there's almost contradictory signs and contradictory symbols. And yet in that way, this piece of art is more reflective uh, of, of actual life and the, the messiness and texture of life. Um, so that's, those are some things that, that come out when I, when, I, when I view this piece as well. Dov, um, I saw that uh, you had a question. Yeah, uh, just taking off from what Rabbi Greenfield was talking about in terms of narrative complexities. So, uh, uh, Robert Katz uh, has uh, like a parallel connection to the Torah <clears throat> in terms of his visual complexities. He, he's, he was, he's so rich in terms of all these visual components uh, that make you want to reflect on their meaning and, and, and uh, deepest significance. Uh, I just want to make one comment about uh, the Tower of Babel. Uh, and it's true that it was uh, a great creative endeavor. Uh, but one of the, and, and everybody was um, united in that. However, the main idea of making the tower was to reach up into Shemaim to fight Hashem, to fight God, uh, and uh, not obey his commandments. And uh, there is a relationship um, that I heard from Rabbi Moshe Meir Weiss a, a number of years ago, right after 9-11, that 9-11 um, too, it, you know, those towers were incredible and they were so stunning and uh, so beautiful to look at. Uh, and then again, uh, they were destroyed. Uh, and uh, because maybe I can't, be the one to say why, because it was a terrible destruction, but um, they were symbols of American wealth and, and power. And um, what can I say? Uh, you know, uh, involvement with wealth and aggrandizement uh, uh, is not the way for us as human beings. I see there are some new questions here. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so many wonderful questions. I guess, yeah. Chloe, that's your question also. Chloe? Hi, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so I just wanted to know, um, Rob, uh, how was it, how did you, which Parsha did you begin with? Was there any order? Did you follow the Parshas in order when creating these pieces? Who, 
Thank you, muted, Robert. I, I looked at the I looked at the death of Moses uh, first, and um, other than that, I think the order was as I was looking at my table and finding objects, and it was like a puzzle, and and which part of the puzzle was coming together first. Um, and and really, that's what guided the uh, the order of how I was building them. Um, I'm curious, Robert. Do you have a sense uh, of a particular scene or maybe a particular object that you kind of feel like you're cutting against the grain? Like you're not you're not depicting this the way traditionalists would want you to depict this, or the way even maybe you used to understand it five years ago. But something came to you, and you're like, "This is this is the vision. This is the edge I, I, I'm giving it." Well, I, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I've heard rabbis say that the Bible is, um, you know, it's a narrative that it's okay to challenge, and not just to sort of accept at face value. And so, you know, I, I, we keep going back to the Tower of Babel, where mm -hmm. um, it's it's a story. It's a story, and. What what would have happened? How the how would the world have been different if the story was written differently? That uh, that that building the structure was not an affront to God, but rather a celebration of mankind, and um, you know, and 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 that story could have sort of set the precedent of how we move forward um, in the world, as opposed to sort of living in a world that we're in constant turmoil and constant conflict with each other. Um, so yeah, so I, I just when I was building that piece, I just refused to accept the fact that that violin was a symbol of of, of evil in any particular way. It, I saw that as a symbol of of celebration, um, and and being an artist, it, it's about creativity. Um, and I I just wonder if 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 also sort of the challenge to the golden calf and and to sort of you know. These, these other sort of artifacts that man created was more sort of a threat of the creator of these objects being placed upon a pedestal. And, and in many ways, that's exactly where we have evolved because look, I mean, we build temples. I mean, all you need to do is walk, go uptown to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it's this extraordinary temple in which we're, we're placing on the altar these objects that are created by man. Um, and so ultimately we do celebrate, um, you know, these wonderful creations and they don't need to be sort of a threat to our spirituality and to our, our belief. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. We also have- And, 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 I, would, and I would elaborate it too. I, I found it very disturbing, you know, when I began to sort of build the um, the second piece of, uh, of of Cain and Abel, and you know, I mean, many of you sort of know the story more thoroughly than I do. But but Cain was not a bad brother. I mean, there's nothing that indicated that he was an evil man growing up. I mean, the reason that he killed his brother was out of jealousy. And for all of you who are parents, um, you would never ever um, show preference to a gift that is given to you by one child as opposed to another child. Because um, you know, the result would be precisely what happened. It would create this sort of tension between within the family. So again, you know, when I think about these stories, I wonder if it was written differently, where, um, where God could have accepted you know, the, the, uh, the items that Cain was bringing to the altar as opposed to sort of rejecting them. And, and, and creating this conflict. And, you know, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Greenfield and I talked a little about this because one of the things that for me is so embedded um, in my life and my family's life is the whole notion of social justice and acceptance and welcoming. Uh, before I was working on this project, I spent a year designing a memorial dedicated to the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And the project that we created was called the Welcome Table, which came from his, his ideal of creating a table of brotherhood that brought people together. I mean, wouldn't it have been easy to sort of construct a story with Cain and Abel in which we were accepting of both sacrifices? 
and they, they were both coming to God with, with, with a good heart. And again, I mean, how would it have changed the broader narrative? Um, it, it's, and, and one of the things that the rabbi said to me is that if I'm looking for the answers of social justice, uh, we may not find it in the five books of Moses. I mean, that the conflict begins right off the bat. I mean, in my first piece, um, I have Eve being banished from, um, from, from the garden. And I remember when I was speaking with the reverend, he said to me, uh, and in that scenario, who was the adult in the room? Was the adult? Was the adult um, Adam or was the adult Eve that brought to us this place of understanding the difference between right and wrong? And, you know, as, as I go through these stories and um, every story is so troubling and it's so wrought with conflict. And, 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 and there's stories and stories that were written by men. And why couldn't the stories be, have been, been written in a different light. And, you know, I, I guess we don't really know that because we, we can't get into the minds of these people that lived thousands of years ago. Um, and that's why I think it's so important when we look at something like West Side Story, where we, where we take these stories, we put them in a contemporary context. And that's why with the Tower of Babel, I, in, embedded in, in that tabloid is, it, is the Guggenheim Museum and is the Parthenon, and is the skyline of New York, and all these great achievements uh, of, of mankind, th that the Tower of Babel would have been one of them. Um, and, and then it always amuses me a bit because before the towers came down, I would also often take my, my, my classes and we would go up to the top of the World Trade Center. And you know, God wasn't up there. I mean, God seems to live a little higher than, uh, than the World Trade Centers. And I highly doubt that the Tower of Babel even came close to being as tall as, uh, as the World Trade Center. So I, I think the notion that it was a threat to God, um, again, it, it, it's a story that was constructed that way. And um, I mean, I still don't understand why all of these stories, so many of these stories create this tension and this conflict. I can tell you the, the story outlasted the, the, the tower itself. So, yep. ultimately, ultimately the, the text has more staying power than the edifices. Um, yeah, that'll be my last note maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone for, for attending. Thank you. Uh, uh, both Professor Katz and Rabbi Greenfield for this very stimulating conversation. And uh, we came in looking at just kind of Kitisa, but then on those order of magnitudes going out, going in, exploring in all those connections. And with uh, the queries of the what exactly we can uh, call from seeing the modernity in those images and thinking about all of those questions together, we're left with more questions and more exploration. And I think that that's so important in uh, not allowing a narrative to die. And the art, the music, the neck of that violin continues to speak even though God punished them through uh, speaking all the different languages and diverging, art and music is a universal language that allows us to kind of rebuild and reconstitute a tower that rises high to the sky. Um, thank you everyone for this. <laughs> yes. Oh. And uh, um, I'll make a quick pitch to my actual, my sermon that, that's up there. Um, I cite a number of classic commentators all struggling with why do we have stories in the Torah? What are they there for? And why do we have complicated stories? So if you want to see some rabbinic voices, medieval rabbinic voices, classic Talmudic uh, rabbinic voices, uh, you can check out those words. It's really an incredible uh, uh, sermon, Vartora. And also we have kind of more ways of, of uh, uh, allowing the conversation to continue by, by if you look into the to on uh, Robert Katz's website and and everywhere that you can find uh, um, more ways of diving into this conversation, uh, you won't be let down because uh, um, that's the goal of, of all of this is to keep growing and keep learning. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Have a beautiful evening and 
find yourselves some uh, some redemption through that retribution. <laughs> good night. Have a good good night. night, everybody. Good night. Thank Thanks you. For